Hi, I'm Charlie Huang from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and the Frederick Health Hospital. Today, we're going to talk about a case that aged me by quite a few years, a severe aortic dissection that happened uh, during an attempt at FFR of the RCA. The patient is a 65-year-old man who presented to the ER with a crescendo angina. He uh, ruled in for a non-STEMI with a troponin of 0.9. His echo showed normal EF uh, with no wall motion abnormalities. On cath, uh, the RCA had a 50 to 60% uh, stenosis distally. Uh, the circumflex had only minor disease, and the uh, LED is uh, shown here. Um, there is clearly an ulcerated lesion in the mid-LED, uh, which we thought was the uh, culprit lesion. So we wired the LED very carefully uh, with a BMW wire, uh, being especially careful uh, to avoid wiring the ulcer and uh, dissecting the vessel. And uh, once the wire crossed, uh, things uh, were relatively straightforward. Uh, we used a 3.0 pre-dill balloon, a 3.5 stent, and a 4.0 uh, post-dill uh, NC balloon. And we had a very nice uh, final angiographic result uh, in the LED. OCT uh, showed excellent uh, stent sizing and uh, strut apposition. And uh, we now turn uh, to uh, the RCA. So here's what the RCA looks like. Um, there is a uh, shepherd's crook, uh, approximately, and there is a borderline uh, 50 to 60% stenosis distally. Um, we were on the fence about the significance of this distal lesion, uh, so we decided to perform FFR uh, to assess uh, hemodynamic uh, significance. And here is where things start to get interesting, and unfortunately, uh, the CINEs uh, were not uh, recorded here. We were actually able to get uh, the FFR pressure wire fairly easily around the shepherd's crook uh, into the distal RCA. But when we did a test injection, uh, we clearly saw uh, contrast staining in the proximal RCA and the dreaded white line in the coronary. We had a dissection uh, near the ostium of the RCA, probably uh, from the JR4 guide. But um, no big deal, we thought. Uh, we already had a wire down, and it clearly looked to be in true lumen, and all we needed to do uh, was a stent uh, to tack up uh, the dissection. It was a little bit challenging, uh, but we were eventually able to place a 4.0 by 38 millimeter DES uh, from the ostium hanging a little bit in the, in the aorta uh, into the proximal RCA uh, using a uh, guide liner. So here is what the RCA looked like uh, after the 4.0 millimeter stent went in proximally. The uh, dissection should have been tacked up by the stent, right? But notice that there is a very odd looking uh, contrast reflux at the ostium of the RCA. It almost has an appearance of a perforation, but where was all that contrast going to? It doesn't look like it's going to the pericardium, and it certainly doesn't seem to be filling the lumen of the aorta like normal. But then the patient started complaining of back pain, and then the unthinkable dawned on us. The RCA had dissected back to the aorta and up into the aortic wall. The contrast that we are seeing is blood dumping into the false lumen of the ascending aorta through a wide open tract from the ostium of the proximal RCA into the aortic wall. We were dealing with an actively dissecting ascending aorta. So why didn't the stent tack up our dissection? After all, that's what stents are supposed to do. And in most dissections, uh, stents are used to tack up the dissection flap and close the dissection plane. So what is different in this case? Well, my thought is that we had a quite large and deep dissection uh, near the ostium of the RCA. And when that happens, and when the mouth of the dissection is perpendicular to the vessel surface, placing a stent may not be sufficient to close the mouth of the dissection. So, for instance, if we have a dissection near the ostium of the RCA that went straight up into the aortic wall, effectively you have a hole, a perforation, with blood spilling uh, from the RCA into the false lumen in the aortic wall. So just stenting the RCA uh, won't work here. So if we're essentially dealing with a perforation from the RCA into the false lumen of the aortic wall, we decided to treat it like a perforation. And the first thing uh, to do is to balloon tamponade it off. Uh, 
But with the highly, uh, with the freshly placed uh, osteal stent uh, hanging out into the aorta, the angled shepherd's crook, and the minimally supportive FFR wire that we had, we had a really tough time passing a balloon back into the RCA. The FFR, FFR wire kept coming back with all of the pushing of the balloon forward. And with more pushing of the balloon, the FFR wire flew out and the guide disengaged. I cannot think of a worse time to lose wire. We had a wide open perforated dissection into the aortic wall and the French list stented ostium right at a shepherd's crook. So uh, we uh, got back into the RCA with the JR4 with a lot of difficulty. And because of the osteal stent, the engagement was very tenuous. And rewiring the RCA was not easy either. Uh, we chose to use a hydrophilic pilot 50 wire because it's slippery. And because it's slippery, uh, there's less friction against the wall of the tortuous RCA, and it's less likely to kick the tenuous R uh, JR4 guide back out. We also used a uh, super cross microcatheter, both for the support and also to avoid getting underneath the freshly placed and not yet post dilated uh, RCA stent. And once we got the wire and microcatheter down, uh, we switched it out uh, to a BHW wire uh, for more support. But even with a BHW wire, we still could not get a balloon into the proximal RCA until we used a guide liner. And finally, we did a prolonged, a prolonged balloon inflation, uh, 15 minutes uh, in the proximal RCA, hoping uh, to close off uh, the mouth of the dissection. But after the prolonged balloon inflation, uh, the dissecting intrawall perforation was still uh, not sealed. Uh, we can still see active flow uh, into the aortic wall. How was our patient doing? Well, uh, other than some relatively mild back pain, he was actually remarkably stable. He had no chest pain, there were no ECG changes, and his blood pressure and heart rate uh, remained the same. Uh, we were probably more tachycardic uh, than the patient. So uh, we did another prolonged uh, balloon inflation, uh, another 15 minutes. Uh, we did keep anticoagulation going. Uh, we still had equipment in the coronary arteries and certainly did not want to deal with coronary or stent thrombosis at this point. And in general, anticoagulation should not be stopped in perforations until your equipment is out of the coronary. I have done a few videos on coronary perforations in which we go through how to handle perforations in greater detail. And I've got the, some of those uh, links uh, in the comments sections uh, below. So after the second round of balloon inflation, we still see active flow into the aortic wall. But uh, in this city, we do see a little bit more of the normal reflux into the aortic lumen. What do we do next? So since we are essentially dealing with an intra-wall perforation, uh, we decided to use a covered stent to seal up the mouth of the dissection. We went ahead and deployed a 4.0 by 16 millimeter graph master covered stent over the mouth of the dissection and took it up uh, to a 4.5 millimeter uh, NC balloon. And after uh, deploying the graph master, uh, flow into the aortic wall finally stopped. And there is now a more normal uh, contrast reflux uh, into the uh, lumen of the aorta. Unfortunately, the mid and distal RCA now do appear compromised, uh, most probably from the propagating intramural hematoma uh, that's coming from the, uh, the section more uh, proximally. So uh, we went ahead and placed uh, two uh, long stents uh, in the mid RCA and noticed that we intentionally chose longer stents than usual uh, to pin in uh, the intramural hematoma. We also used relatively lower inflation pressures so as not to uh, further propagate uh, the hematoma. So here is the final angiographic result, which uh, we thought was reasonably satisfactory. Uh, there was normal reflux into the lumen of the aorta, and there was no residual flow uh, into the wall of the aorta. We also did an injection of the left coronary artery, which uh, thankfully uh, remained unchanged. So a few things to keep in mind uh, when you're dealing with uh, aortic uh, coronary dissections. Uh, first, uh, if the dissection wraps around the aortic wall, uh, you can get compromise of the contralateral uh, coronary artery. Second, if the dissection spreads into the pericardial sac, uh, you can get pericardial tamponade and shock. Uh, 
Third, um, if the uh, shape of the aortic root is altered significantly, uh, you can get a significant uh, aortic valve uh, insufficiency. And fourth, uh, if the dissection spreads up and around the aortic arch, uh, you can start getting compromise of the great vessels. And any of these complications uh, could require uh, emergency surgery. So uh, we did a stat echo, which uh, fortunately showed uh, no pericardial effusion and no significant uh, aortic regurgitation. And uh, we did a CT, and uh, this is quite impressive and uh, reveals the true extent of the dissection, uh, spreading up uh, in the ascending aorta, around the arch, and then down the descending aorta, all the way down to the level of the renals. And it was truly remarkable that the patient was not more symptomatic or unstable. Thankfully, um, the uh, left coronary and the great vessels were not compromised uh, by the dissection. The patient uh, continued to remain stable, uh, but given the large size of the aortic dissection, uh, he was transferred to a tertiary center as a precaution. And fortunately, uh, he was discharged home a few days later. All right, um, take home messages. Uh, the key point uh, to take away here is that uh, large coronary dissections, especially near the ostium and extending up into the aortic wall, uh, can behave very much like a perforation. A regular stent may not be sufficient to tack it up. You might need a covered stent. For uh, dissections uh, extending into the aortic wall, um, uh, consider the possibility of uh, contralateral coronary compromise, so inject the contralateral coronary artery. Consider the possibility of pericardial effusion and aortic insufficiency, so get serial echoes. And consider the possibility of compromise of the great vessels, uh, so get serial uh, CTs. And in general, management is conservative, but it is probably most prudent uh, to transfer to a tertiary center in case urgent cardiac or aortic surgery is needed. Thank you for watching.